Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. God, I want to change. I want to change. I'm sorry, God, that I'm always asking you to change somebody else. Change me. Change me. Make me. I want you to be proud of me. How many of you want God to be proud of you? Selfishness equals death, but love equals life. Now, if there's anything that we need to pray, we need to say, God, please help me get over myself. I'm not as important as what I probably think I am. Now, we are important to God, but let me tell you, you're not the only person in the world that wants your way, nor are you the only person in the world that should get your way. Why should I get to go eat where I want to tomorrow and Dave have to eat somewhere where he doesn't want to eat? Am I really any more important than he is? I mean, yes, I could say, well, I worked hard all weekend, but there's a possibility that sitting down there listening to me as much as he is is harder work than what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, Dave has sat in thousands and thousands and thousands. I told him, said something about what I was going to preach tonight, and one of the people with us said something, and he said, yeah, I've heard that one about 5,000 times. But you know what? He's attentive. He laughs every time that I'm funny. He compliments me. So he's working too. It's in a different way, but he's right here with me. See, we all get all caught up in ourselves and everything becomes, what about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? And we're not the only person on earth. And as long as we are self-centered, we're going to be miserable. Go to 1 Timothy 5:6. 1 Timothy 5, 6, whereas she who lives in pleasure and self-gratification, giving herself up to luxury and self-indulgence, is dead even while she still lives. My gosh, that's a great scripture. So all those years that I was just full of me, didn't care about anybody being happy but me, everybody was supposed to live to keep me happy, and yes, I was a Christian. I believed in Jesus, but I didn't know anything about what I'm talking to you about tonight. Do you have any idea how many unhappy Christians there are simply because they don't know how to grow up in God? It's not even that they don't want to. They don't know how to. And our natural tendency is the moment that something starts to hurt, we back away from it and think something's wrong with it. That's why I want to make it clear to you that when I say surrender to God, surrender always equals pain first, then pleasure. Dying to self always means suffering in the soul and then excessive joy later on. Crucifixion always comes before resurrection. Friday always comes before Sunday. Can you hear me? We give and then we receive. We sow and then we reap. It's all over the Bible. It's the way of God. When you live in self-gratification and pleasure, only thinking about yourself, you're dead even while you still live. What does that mean? It means that you might be getting your way, but you're full of death in your soul. It's just yucky feeling. Like God said to me, you think you won, but really you lost. Well, then I was like, what did I do that for? Why did I act that way again? Now I knew Dave was, feelings were hurt, and now I had to try to go eat with him and be uncomfortable and, you know, go through that whole thing that we go through all the time. And so then finally I thought, okay, I'll apologize. And, you know, he was gracious to forgive me. But it's so much better to just learn that you don't have to have your way all the time. Amen. Does anybody think you need this tonight? Yeah. Do I have the wrong crowd, the right crowd? How about all of you way up there in the rafters? Do you need this tonight? I see you up there. How many of you guys way up there need this? All right. You're awesome. Many years ago, selfish, self-centered, spoiled Christian brat. Already teaching a Bible study, had a big vision for my life, never would have gotten to where I am had I not let God do what he wanted to do in my life. 
Many are called, few are chosen. A lot of people have a lot that they can do for God, but we have to grow up in order to do that, and it's not easy. I'm going to tell you that it's not easy, but it is worth it. Laying in bed one morning thinking about myself like I always did. <laughs> Making plans for me, trying to think how I can get this person to do this work so I don't have to do it and get Dave to not do, go play golf or something so he could, you know, just dote on me all day. <laughs> thinking about me, thinking about me, thinking about what people don't do for me, what they should do for me, what about me, what about me. The Holy Ghost began to deal with me and he said, Joyce, you, you, you lay there and you get yourself wound up for the day. <laughs> Do you know that when you lay in bed and you think like that in the morning, you, you already are in a bad mood before you ever put your feet on the floor? You've already decided, when, it, when, if, when I go out to that kitchen, <laughs> if those kids left those dishes out last night and they didn't clean their mess up, Come on. You know, some of you have already thought, when I go home from this conference, if that house is a mess. Come on. You, you might as well just go ahead and say it. I am going to go in there and act like I never was at that conference. <laughs> then everybody can think I'm a big phony. So I'm laying there. God says, you're getting yourself all wound up for the day. And then he just, I just had this, like this vision. Like, not an open vision, but I just saw this in my heart. He said, Joyce, you're like a little robot. The devil comes and starts putting thoughts in your mind, and he just winds you up. And he said, now this is what you look like to me all day. What about me? 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 Okay, you got your way in Georgia. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. It is unbelievable what God has done with that robot. Love you too. <laughs> now let's look at 1 John 3, 14. Selfishness equals death. Love equals life. Forget yourself. Lay in bed in the morning and think about what you can do for somebody else. I do that now. I spend some time every morning thinking about something that I can do for somebody else that day. I do it on purpose. I don't have to feel like it. I think about what I have that I can give away, who I'm going to be with that day that I might bless. God, help me compliment every person I come near today. You have to be mindful to be a blessing to people. Galatians 6.10 says, be mindful to be a blessing, especially to the household of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, seek to do good to everybody. Seek it. Don't wait for it to fall on you. Seek it. Pursue it. Go after it. The devil's afraid of somebody who walks in love. He can't handle somebody who walks in love. We need to have a fiery, red-hot love walk. Be fervent in our love walk. We know that we have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love the brethren, our fellow Christians. He who does not love abides, remained, is held and kept continually in spiritual death. How many of you see that? I'm going to read it to you again. We know that we've passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love the brethren. Now, you know, when you love people, you don't gossip about them. When you love people, you're not so quick to judge them and criticize them. When you love people, you help meet their needs if they have one. So I want to make sure that we just don't throw this love word around. Oh, yes, praise the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. Hug, hug, <laughs> kiss, kiss. I just can't stand any more of that. Now go hug somebody. Tell them you love them with the love of the Lord. 
Yeah, well, what are you doing for anybody else? <laughs> Where are you when somebody has a need? How quick are we to judge and criticize? How quick are we to forgive? Love forgives. Love is not easily offended. Love is patient. Love is kind. <laughs> we can talk about love, but it's more than a sermon. Love is manifested in how we treat people. How we treat people. Not how they treat us, how we treat them. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, not do unto others as they do unto you. We know that we have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love the brethren, our fellow Christians. He who does not love abides, remained, is held, and kept continually in spiritual death. I'm just going to tell you point blank. If you want to increase your joy, how many of you in here want to increase your joy? Well, I'm going to tell you a surefire, 100% guaranteed way to do it. Get yourself off your mind and be a blessing to somebody else. Come on, get yourself off your mind, be a blessing to somebody else. And every time you hear that, well, what about me? You come up in your head, just say, no, no. God, show me somebody that I can be a blessing to. Every day that you're tempted to waste, sitting around feeling sorry for yourself, say, no, no. I'm going to die to self-pity. I'm not going to waste another day sitting here feeling sorry for myself and being jealous of somebody else who has what I want. I am going to be a blessing to people and God is just going to have to take care of me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Mark 8, 31 through 36, verse 31, And he, he being Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must out of necessity suffer many things and be tested and disapproved and rejected by the elders. So, now Jesus sits down in his, with his disciples and he said, Now look, I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to be tested. I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. <laughs> And after three days, I'll rise again. Well, probably by the time he got to the rising again part, they were already so bothered by the suffering part, they didn't even hear him. And he said this freely, frankly, plainly, and explicitly, making it unmistakable, and watch what happened. And Peter took him by the hand, led him off to the side, facing him, turned Jesus around, faced him, and began to rebuke him. And God still ended up using Peter in a mighty way. There's hope for me. How many of you can say there's hope for me too? You know why? Because Peter did all that out of fear. And turning around his back to Peter and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. He, he knew that it wasn't even Peter. It was Satan working through Peter's fear. His fear of suffering, his fear of persecution, his fear of going through anything painful. It's amazing how the flesh will try to squirm out of anything uncomfortable. But I'll tell you one thing, I'm not telling you anything that God hasn't fed me. When I, when I teach you, I'm teaching me too. I tried to do it the easy way and I'll tell you what, the narrow path leads to life. The broad path leads to destruction. And on the narrow path, there's no room for all my fleshly baggage, nor is there any room for yours. It's got to go. But it leads to a life worth living. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have a mind intent on promoting what God wills, but what pleases men. You're not on God's, God's side, but that of men. And Jesus called to him the throng and his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone intends to come after me, let him deny himself, forget, ignore, disown, and lose sight of himself and all of his own interests, and let him take up his cross and follow me. Now, look, this does not mean that you can never have anything that you want, that you can never do anything that you want. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your life. Matter of fact, it means just the opposite. Because here's, here's what we need to understand. It's not what we own that makes us happy. It's our attitude that makes us happy. 
And God will give you nice things when you can be happy with or without them. God may give you that promotion, the position that you desire, when you can want it for the right reasons and not to make you feel secure and feel good about yourself. Well, we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. In Galatians 6, 14, Paul said, I'm crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. Well, what did he mean? In Galatians 2, he said, It's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me, and the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself up for me. Well, what do you mean it's no longer you that lives? What do you mean it's Christ that lives in you? He meant he'd come into oneness with God. That Christ in him was leading things now. That it wasn't him leading it. He said, this fleshly part of me is dead, so now God can work through me. Well, you don't get dead without dying. And it might be interesting to you to know that when Paul said that in Galatians 2.20, it was 20 years after his conversion on the Damascus Road. It thrilled me when I learned that. Because sometimes the devil and even people try to make us think that we get saved on Monday and by Wednesday everything should be worked out. <laughs> well, we're on a journey with God. From glory to glory, little by little. Paul said, I've not arrived, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to the good things that are ahead. Now, the Bible tells us not to love the world nor the things that are in the world. Well, I do like things. You like things. Let's don't lie and pretend like we don't. I like pretty things. What did Paul mean when he said, I'm crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me? I believe with all my heart that this is what Paul meant. He meant, I can have things and enjoy them, but if I don't have them, I can still enjoy my life. And it's not about God not wanting us to have anything. He doesn't want the things to have us. We can desire things, but we must not lust after things. And here's what lust does to you. It steals your joy. The minute that you begin to lust after anything, whether it's a new car, a new house, a certain person you want to be in relationship with, a position at work, all of a sudden that lust steals your joy. And now you can't be happy if you don't have that. Can't be happy if you don't have that. Got to be married. Got to have kids. Got to have a new house. Got to have a new car. Got to get promoted. Got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. You know, we live in a nice house and I enjoy it. It's very pretty. I may like my surroundings better when I'm there. But you know what? I've been pretty happy in my hotel room. And it's not very nice. It's got blue and white carpet and red chairs. And it's like, the lights in the bathroom make me look yellow when I look in there. The light above the sink buzzes. The fan in the bathroom roars. Come on. Your joy is not in your surroundings. Yes, I'll be glad to get home. But you know what? I can honestly tell you, if I, if I had to give that house up, I could give it up and go live in an apartment and still be happy. You can't, you got to be happy in God and not with stuff. We need to keep and maintain a right relationship with things. Love God, enjoy things, but don't ever let them get ahead of God. Don't ever let them get ahead of God. And the minute that you think you cannot be happy if you don't have something, then the devil's got control. Hold everything loosely. Be a steward, not an owner. Whatever you have, it's a gift from God. If he ever wants it back, you better let go of it quickly. Come on. This is one of the reasons why giving is so important. When God asks you to give something that you have, if you can't give it, <laughs> then it's got you. And that's why sometimes God will even ask us to give things or give up things that don't make any sense to us. Doesn't make any sense at all. But he's just testing you to see how important 
things are to you. Let's look at first John, I mean at first Timothy 6. How can we be in the world and not be of the world? We have to keep a right relationship with it. If there's a promotion at work that you want, pray about it. Be a good employee. Give them a reason to want to promote you. Pray about it. And if it's right, let God do it. And if somebody else gets it, be happy for them. Did you hear what I said? If somebody else gets it, be happy for them. Don't you dare have a bumper sticker on your car and a cross around your neck and go around railing on some other employee to all the other people at work because they got what you wanted. 1 Timothy 6, 6, And it is indeed a source of immense profit for godliness accompanied with contentment. That contentment, which is a sense of inward sufficiency, is of great and abundant gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and obviously we cannot take anything out. Don't spend your life worshiping things you can't take with you. But if we have food and clothing with these, we shall be content and satisfied. Now, don't get nervous. That doesn't mean that that's all God wants you to have. But I know lots of people in the world tonight that would be hilariously happy if they could just have food. I know people that would think they were in the middle of a miracle if they just, if somebody would just come and dig a well in their village so they didn't have to walk six hours every day to get some muddy water full of bugs. Honestly and truly, we have had so much in our Western civilization that it has just about ruined us. And that's why it's very important for us to not let things control us. And I don't mean that God doesn't want to bless us. If God wants to bless anybody, why wouldn't it be his kids? I believe that God says we're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. We lend to many nations. We never have to borrow. I think he wants us to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The good things of the kingdom are for God's children. But he doesn't want us to have to have them to be happy. And if you can't be happy without it, then I can tell you you won't be happy with it. If you can't get happy in the valley, you won't be happy on the mountaintop. And I know some of you don't believe me. You think, well, if I could just get this, I'd be happy. I mean, I chased after that dream for you. Oh, if I could just do this, I'd be happy. If I could just, if I didn't have to do this, I'd be happy. If Dave would do this, I'd be happy. If the kids would do this, I'd be happy. And sometimes God has to give you some things just to show you that you won't be happy with them. How many of you have been through that and you know you get it and it tickles your flesh a little bit and then you're still not happy? Why? Because the problem is not in what we have or don't have, it's in us. A grateful attitude makes you happy. Grateful. I've been waking up the morning and just saying to God before I ever get out of bed, thank you God that I can walk and talk and see and hear that I can just swing my legs over this bed and put my feet on the floor and get right up. And I know there are people watching from television that you can't do that, but there's something else you can be thankful for. There's something we can all be thankful for. And a grateful heart leads you to a place of contentment. And contentment is a beautiful thing to God. I love what the Apostle Paul said when he said, I've learned to be content. It didn't get implanted in him. He learned to be content. He said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to, be, to abound, and I know how to be content either way. It's time to get happy. Just having that motherly thing on me tonight, I'd love to come down there and get some of you and just shake you. <laughs> just to say, get this. <laughs> get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Don't spend another year going around and around and around the same dumb mountain chasing after one mirage after another after another that you think is going to quench your thirst, but it's not. <laughs> Woo! 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. Come into oneness with God. God, your will be done and not mine. Teach me, God, if I can't say something good to keep my mouth shut. Teach me not to judge and criticize and be negative and have a bad attitude. God, I want to change. I want to change. I'm sorry, God, that I'm always asking you to change somebody else. Change me. Change me. Make me. I want you to be proud of me. How many of you want God to be proud of you? The Bible says that we are His personal representatives in the earth, that God is making His appeal to the world through us. What an amazing responsibility. God has an inheritance for each and every one of us. And the way we receive it is through faith and patience. Remember, whatever He asks us to do, He has already given us the ability to do that. We can accomplish the goals that God sets in front of us because He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us.